morning everyone, I think it's time to start. Uh, my name is Ruslan Rulaev and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the panel titled Use of Personal Data by Online Platforms, Do We Still Own Our Data? Uh, we had a slight change, uh, I will be chairing the panel and Max Schoens will be speaking, just to let you know. Um, it is no secret that online platforms such as social networks like Facebook or LinkedIn accumulate significant amount of data related to their users. The goal of this panel is to discuss whether it can be said that online platforms own such data and whether they can deny access to such data to third parties. Now, there are two aspects to this issue. The first aspect is the relationship between the online platforms and their users when they want to access the data related to them. Let's call it the B2C aspect. And the second aspect is the relationship between the online platforms and other internet businesses uh, that may want to access the data held by the online platforms. Let's call it the B2B aspect. Uh, what we will do, we will try to discuss both of these aspects. I think I should also mention from the start that, as one may expect, the topic of this panel is closely linked to GDPR. But I should say from the start that we will not focus solely on GDPR, and we will also discuss other legislation and the situation in other countries uh, which are not member states of the European Union. Uh, now allow me to introduce the members of the panel. Uh, the panel will be moderated by Katarzyna Shimilevich, uh, the president of Panoptikin Foundation, and we have four speakers. Uh, we have Irina Shumina, senior associate at Brian K. Flayton Paisner, Snezhana Surdish, uh, legal officer at the European Data Protection Supervisor, Mark Schrems, honorary director and lawyer at NOIP, European Center for Digital Rights, and we have Yun Shin van der Saib, attorney at law at Timelex. Kasa, over to you. Hello, those are the panelists and those are the discussion points. Uh, welcome early morning, thank you for making an effort. It was also an effort for us, but I'm sure we will have, uh, I know we will have interesting discussion because I know this audience and I know those speakers. Um, we will try to structure a discussion around the points that you can, uh, you can see on the screen, so I will not, uh, I will not read them. Uh, but I, will also, uh, I can also tell you that uh, our plan is to make it quite interactive, so please, please be prepared to, uh, to come along. We will start with a first round of, uh, of more structured questions, uh, me asking panelists uh, to share their thoughts on, on, on key aspects of, of, of this uh, really broad and complicated topic, in fact, but quite soon uh, after the short second round, we will open it uh, for, for discussion with, with everybody in the room. Uh, I would like to start um, um, with, um, uh, by inviting Irina to, to make her uh, comments, uh, bringing uh, us perspective uh, outside of the EU. Uh, as uh, Ruslan said, we will not only focus on, uh, on GDPR, but, but on the broader context. Uh, I know there is an interesting case uh, in, in, in Russia that we, will, we are very interested to, to, to hear more, uh, dealing with this question of data, of data ownership. Uh, so my, my, my question to Irina is, um, uh, is uh, please share with us from business perspective um, how, um, how legally speaking uh, companies are approaching the data ownership question, especially with regard to data generated by algorithms, generated by, by their intellectual property that they see most valuable. Do they need this concept? Do they fight for this concept? Do we need this, uh, especially having a GDPR? Five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Katarzyna. Thank you, Ruslan, for introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is true. In Russia, we are now dealing with a really interesting case. Um, it's double data versus contactive. Contact is so-called Russian Facebook. So it's a major social network. And the case is about data ownership in Russia. Can I show the presentation, please? <laughs> I'm glad to see myself there, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> so the social network filed a lawsuit against a tech startup called Double Data. Double Data developed a software that, is, um, that allows to search for people on the internet with the exactness of 99%. So they use open data and they search for people. And Contact has said that they have a so generous right to the database of user data and that no one can access it without their permission. 
even though the data is open. So this is the precedent case about big data that can influence the future of the IT sector and digital economy. And why am I telling it here is because uh, Russian legislation on database protection and on uh, data protection. It's actually quite similar to the EU legislation. Our database um, uh, provisions in the civil code are word to word to the EU directive on database protection. And as we know, uh, there haven't been such cases in Europe so far. So we believe that this case may have some impact even on the European Union, although we are not members of that. So this is how it works. This is the double data software that goes to internet and searches for people uh, on various platforms where people let their, uh, left their data in open regime. And there are key questions of the case. First, is there any IP right to the database of user data? Because for a sui generis right, you need to prove the substantial investment into creation of the database. And if uh, we think about the social network, we all know there's people who put data voluntarily, and social network doesn't pay them for that. So social network basically doesn't invest into creation of the database. The second question is, uh, do search engines infringe IP rights? Because this software of double data is really similar to search engines. Um, so we are facing this question as well. And the third one, can actually social network limit access to the publicly available information? As you all know, we have open pages, we have private pages. If I want my page to be open. I give my permission to everyone in the, on the internet, this is the essence of internet, to access it, to maybe use it in some sense. So is social network actually in a position to say no, I decide, not the users decide? Um, so this is what we are facing, and I think you uh, are aware of the case that is really similar going on in the US. HiQ Labs is also the technical startup who developed the software that was uh, searching for people. And LinkedIn, you all know what is LinkedIn. And LinkedIn filed a lawsuit against HiQ saying that uh, they didn't allow them to use the data that is on LinkedIn in open regime. And the uh, District Court of California already issued the decision in the first instance saying that uh, giving private entities like LinkedIn authority to block viewers from assessing, accessing information publicly available on the website uh, creates a threat of free flow of information and this also can be anti-competitive. We also refer to this case. We know that it's still ongoing, that, uh, that we are waiting for the decision in the US, but still we think that this approach is probably accurate in terms of internet and free flow inform of information and we'll see how our case will go on, it's still uh, pending. There was a first instance, second instance, cassation that uh, uh, returned the case again to the first instance because it disagreed with the uh, first two decisions of the courts. So this case in Russia is now really a major one. I encourage everyone to follow it with us um, and uh, to share any opinions or ask questions about this situation. Thank you. Thank you for those opening remarks. I think it was a um, really interesting uh, dive uh, into case law uh, and important cases coming up. So now let's move back to the EU. Uh, and uh, Schnezana is on our panel a representative of the regulator, um, European Data Protection uh, supervi Supervisor, or at least uh, one of the authorities. Uh, and uh, to the business uh, to consumer perspective, yes, we saw legal controversy in cases quoted by Irina. That that there is still uncertainty to what extent other businesses can require access to data generated by, 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 by companies, by private companies. But what about users? Under GDPR in Europe, obviously users have rights to access their data, to move their data. Um, to what extent this right uh, that we have under GDPR could 
also be in conflict with um, with um, protected, legally protected um, private interests of, of companies, how this tension has been resolved under GDPR. Uh, Schnezana, if I can invite your comments. Just, uh, to say, uh, sorry, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I would like to point out that uh, there cannot be an implicit assumption that platforms have some uh, automatic rights to process personal data just because they, uh, for their own purposes, just because they provide a service where users... Uh, Microphone. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, just uh, because uh, the users put in the, uh, their data and uh, uh, just because the data is made public doesn't mean that uh, uh, data protection doesn't apply. You still have to have always a legal basis legal ground, uh, you have to uh, clarify uh, or justify why you're using it. All the other uh, data protection rights apply. And uh, you have to be certain that uh, data protection is a fundamental right. It's not something that uh, would be, okay, it can be limited, but it's not something that would be always overridden by the interests of the business, the interest of the controller. And uh, when we talk about cases, for example, the uh, protection of uh, databases, protection of trade secrets and so on against businesses, well, businesses, to enforce their rights against other businesses, they have different remedies under different laws. Um, in the GDPR, for, uh, for certain rights, Okay, we we'll have, okay, uh, in our context, maybe the most important uh, uh, right of uh, access, right of portability, right of uh, uh, not to be subject to automated decision making, but also the, uh, all the other rights are important to either start implementing, exercising those rights, or as an addition. And uh, we have to be, uh, be clear, any kind of processing has to comply with Articles 5 and 6 of the GDPR. Uh, okay. So, um, when it comes to the right of access and uh, the right of data portability, um, the businesses have to provide the information. However, they can, for example, in the case of uh, uh, providing a copy of the information, they can limit what... Uh, uh, information they provide. Uh, there, this is uh, specifically stated in uh, Recital uh, 3, or uh, sorry, in Paragraph 3 of uh, uh, the article on uh, access right and uh, in Paragraph 4. They can take uh, um, they can take into account uh, the rights and interests of others. And the, uh, Recital 63 uh, clarifies that this interests also mean the trade secrets, uh, intellectual property, copyright protection, and also is, uh, uh, the guidance of uh, Article 29, Working Party, on uh, data portability, but, uh, that was endorsed by the, EDP, uh, the EDPB. You can say also that certain other uh, contractual rights can be taken into account. However, that does not mean that you you do not provide any information. There always have to be some kind of balancing uh, implemented. And of course, uh, if uh, the data subject is not satisfied with uh, either uh, the reply of the uh, controller or the refusal to, uh, for the controller to provide them the copy or, um, uh, of, the, of their data or uh, the data that they want to port to give to someone else or reuse for their own purposes, um, then they can go to data protection authorities. Uh, here the oversight of the data protection authorities is quite important because then the uh, data protection authorities have the right to access also, well, at least most of uh, the data protection authorities in member states have the right to access also business secrets, trade secrets, and uh, any other kind of uh, confidential information. We have to also take into account that sometimes uh, um, the procedural laws uh, might be different for data protection authorities. However, look at the uh, directive on... Uh, um, Moment, let me find exactly the number of the directive. Uh, uh, yes, uh, the directive on yeah, the, the protecting databases. That's the directive 96 uh, 9 EC, paragraph 13, says that uh, that 
this directive is without prejudice to provisions concerning, in particular, uh, copyright and so on, and including data protection. And uh, also the data protection authorities and other authorities uh, can access certain da uh, data under different laws. Here we also have to think that, uh, okay, maybe uh, con data subjects, but also consumers, wouldn't get uh, proper redress in one field, they could try to turn to other authorities, like uh, uh, consumer protection authorities, competition authorities can start looking into, uh, can start looking into uh, possible misuse of dominant positions, uh, refusal of, uh, of uh, access to the market and so on. And uh, we have seen now, uh, in uh, recent times, that uh, different uh, networks of different authorities, for example, like uh, the, the initiative of the DPS, the Digital Clearinghouse, uh, connecting uh, data protection authorities, consumer authorities, competition authorities, working, trying to see, uh, find a solution uh, to one problem from different angles. Uh, there are uh, uh, Consumer authorities or consumer protection authorities uh, uh, trying to activate their their networks. Um, uh, cons consumer protection organisations have been filing complaints with different data protection authorities. They've been filing complaints with the uh, with uh, the consumer uh, protection authorities. They've been filing uh, complaints to uh, to business authorities, trade uh, authorities, so I'm thinking here uh, the complaint, uh, uh, complaints that have been introduced, for example, uh, by BEOC, the European uh, Consumer Organization. There have been uh, complaints introduced by uh, Privacy International, by uh, uh, NYOB. So uh, mm. there are different actions taking place. We have to all work together, try to see how to find a solution, and uh, then uh, maybe we would need to even change our interpretation of the law, change uh, maybe in the future when the Commission reviews their uh, uh, reviews the, the GDPR, it's coming in uh, 25, well, they're going okay. to implement a report. Um, so we see changes could be coming uh, with practice, we'll see how uh, things turn out. Th th thank you for, for uh, making a beautiful opening for um, the practitioner who is making those complaints on our panel. I wanted to move uh, to, to Max Schrems uh, to invite uh, you, Max, to share your experience exactly on what uh, Schnezana mentioned. So this struggle or, or, or cooperation, if you like, uh, meant to test uh, uh, what GDPR allows users in terms of access, but also uh, what sort of leeway it leaves for the companies. I'm curious to hear your, your insights from Noib's uh, um, um, experience in fighting to, to, to get access to data, uh, what obstacles you encountered, and what is your interpretation of uh, the right to access and the right to move data under GDPR, uh, especially if you, if you can comment on this, uh, do individuals have unquestionable right to access inferred data, data generated by algorithms, or is there any controversy at all, uh, in your opinion? Uh, and I know we have many more people in the room um, fighting for access, so uh, be aware we will come also to your experience. Max. Um, just going to do that, put this over here. Um, so we basically have two issues usually. Um, Probably I'm noisier, so this has to go further away. Um, yeah, so for um, the access rights, we use, like we had a first round of access complaints, for example, that we filed a week ago. There was like 10 different companies. There we actually didn't have much of an issue about um, any conflicting rights. They simply just didn't give us the data anyways, like even stuff that's explicitly in GDPR was simply not in the data set in the end. So we're still on a very basic level of this debate and practice. We ran into, um, mainly with what gets into that issue, we ran into um, Article 15-4, like paragraph four that says, um, I just have it in front of me, the right to attain a copy um, referred to in paragraph three shall not um, adversely affect the rights and freedoms of others. And I remember when GDPR was debated that we had tons and tons of suggestions on how to balance other rights with the right to access. No one could agree on anything, so we ended up with this sentence that actually doesn't say much. <laughs> it basically, if you literally take that sentence, it says, if there's any other right, then basically your right to um, access would be gone. 
Um, fundamentally, why that cannot be true is because the right to access is a fundamental right in Article 8, um, Paragraph 2 of the Charter, so this has to be balanced somehow, and I think that's probably where these cases are going to pan out, that we'll get into this balancing test, and that is going to be something that ultimately, as all of this, is going to be decided by the Court of Justice. Um, so that's, that's w- that one for question it. for like conflicting rights. I think that's where we're going to end up. And since it's a fundamental right, I guess the, you know, we have some business interest here is not going to cut it much. But um, obviously that debate is going to come up sooner or later. Um, one thing we ran into, what you mentioned, is the generated data. And there we usually have the issue that they, a lot of companies argue that a lot of these um, you know, big data analytics is only done on the fly, so there's no tangible data later on. Like it's generated in the moment you load a page or you Is use. that what companies claim or is that your experience? That that's that's what they claim and it's hard to prove otherwise. Um, there are some situations where you can just say, you know, just by the processing power that you would need to do that every time someone loads a page, it's rather un- unlikely that this is not stored somewhere in the background. But that becomes a technical question where as a lawyer, I can just say, you know, A says that, B says the other thing, you need a, a technical expert to figure that out then. Um, sometimes you're able to figure certain things out that um, just by technical analysis from the outside that you can say, you know, this can possibly not be done that way. Um, but that is something where it's hard to prove usually um, because if it's really just generated in the moment and gone again, obviously you're not going to be able to even give access to that later because the data that physically doesn't exist, there's no right to access. So, <laughs> um, And that is, that is an issue for like that generated data. One thing that I want to throw in into debate, um, so far we kind of assumed that we're always only a data subject on any of these platforms. We actually have a case pending in Vienna right now with Facebook, and it's very similar to, because I saw the colleagues back there from the ULD in Schleswig-Holstein, the big question on these platforms is oftentimes, aren't we even controllers? And I think that is, um, may change a lot of that debate, because if, for example, a normal Facebook page the company runs, you're a joint controller, at least according to the Court of Justice, then the question arises, a normal face, private Facebook page is nothing but that. It's just a page that I technically control for most of it. I think we would have to separate the different purposes, like my pictures that I have on Facebook is probably a private purpose where I'm, I would be the controller, that's at least what we would think. Um, on the other hand, if there is like some big data analytics for advertisement, Obviously, Facebook would be the controller because I have no control over that whatsoever. And I think that would then oftentimes shift the debate to a certain extent um, because roughly where we're coming from is saying if you post something on your private WordPress, we all kind of assume that the person that runs the WordPress system is the controller, not WordPress. Now, if I post something on Facebook, technically it's not much different than a blog, like a post on WordPress, um, but suddenly we all assume that we're only data subject and have no control whatsoever. But like we actually had that in, in the submission. You actually have more choices on Facebook on who can see it, um, how, when it's gonna be deleted, all that kind of stuff than a normal CM, a CMS system like WordPress does. So the question arises, aren't you even more in control of that data um, than otherwise? And is in that case Facebook not just one of the technical means you use? Um, that may be different for each processing operation on a platform like that. But the interesting situation, if we think about it like that, is if I'm the controller of it, then there's no debate who runs the database and who can use that data in one or the other way. And I think it's kind of interesting to look at that a bit closer, and we have to look at each software, each processing operation to figure that out. Oftentimes, you are only the data subject, and we're out of that debate. But I think it's, it's, it's false to assume that from the beginning, because we'll oftentimes be as a user in a stronger position. Last thing on that, what's kind of interesting is, um, there's actually recital 18 in the GDPR that explicitly says um, that this would fall under the household exemption. So that's also kind of interesting because if the GDPR kind of foresaw that running Facebook, uh, running a um, a, a social network, they don't call it Facebook obviously, um, you would fall under the household exemption. That question only arises if you're first a controller even. And um, which in our debate, but that's now really for the legal geeks in like details, it's kind of even inter- more interesting because if you are a controller that falls outside of the GDPR because of the household exemption, you probably still have the rights as a controller and the processor falls under GDPR, which is kind of funny because the controller is actually outside of the law, the processor may be in it. It's a bit the same situation when you have a controller outside of the EU um, that is not in the market and so on. And that is kind of where we're looking into if we can get something out of it and actually get the user more into power by simply saying, I'm the controller and you're just my processor, you're mm-hmm. technically a slave to me. 
<laughs> that's that's interesting argument with the controller. I think we will dive deeper into this in the discussion. But let me uh, before uh, we move on. Uh, to our 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 last introductory um, remarks, uh, let me clarify: Did Noip uh, file any complaint uh, on the grounds that you were refused access to generated data, say on Facebook? Was it part of any of your complaints, or you don't have? Um, yet uh, open debate with any authority on this issue? We don't have an open debate right now. Um, in the original like 1,200 pages I got in 2011 or whatever, there was that debate and there were so certain data that Facebook says that, that you generate and we were then asking why this data is not in the data set and in very little instances um, that was actually where they argued that this is like generated on the fly. Okay. Um, but that was not becoming a bigger issue, honestly. Um, we ran into that more. We get emails from people that are denied on that basis. So we did get that mm -hmm. in response from individuals. Um, but we did not have it in any of the test cases so far. But that may usually be a counter argument. So we brought it up and said, we didn't get all the data. You argue that you have more data. It's not in the data set. Where is it? That may now be in the answers to these complaints that they say, oh, it's in like the nirvana because it's chased. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. So uh, Yushi, I'm, I'm turning to you because you have a, a unique on this panel experience um, uh, as a DPO, a data protection uh, officer, although not under GDPR because it's uh, Switzerland we are talking about, for a social media platform. Uh, so you will certainly hear those arguments from business uh, being social media platform, why it might be complicated in practice to respond to a user coming and saying, tell me everything you know about me, including my generated data. Uh, so uh, what are business concerns or, or interests with regard to sharing the full picture from their, their databases with the users? Let's now look at um, B2C perspective, if, if, if we can. And especially, do you have experience in, in this data generated on the fly and disappearing from databases, how you deal with, with such legal question? Uh, thank you. So yes, I have indeed uh, been advising a, a social uh, media platform, Goodwill, uh, which is a, a Swiss um, platform. And, uh, but as an attorney at Timelex, well, I, but me, we uh, represent um, mainly companies in the EU. Um, for Goodwill, it's important, uh, Katarina already mentioned it, but the Swiss DPO is a different concept from the EU DPO. Um, it's, it's, it's mainly to uh, decrease the administrative burden uh, that, is, uh, that, that is imposed on companies, uh, for example, for the declaration of, of processing activities to the PFPAT. Uh, Goodwill is an, you can compare it with some kind of a LinkedIn, but then for students, it's focused on students and young professionals. And it's connecting them with in, uh, interesting universities and um, employers. So in that way, Goodwill is dealing with uh, large quantities of personal data. Uh, I can take, of course, I can take a stand uh, like on, on uh, what would be a typical response uh, from ISPs in general, uh, but I can uh, speak from my own limited experience. And before I, I delve in, um, in this business interest discussion, uh, I, want, I want to point out that there is mainly two difficulties with um, the majority of uh, data subject requests, so they, so they request themselves. Uh, first of all, often it's not possible to verify the identity uh, of the data subject. And then second of all, uh, the requests are just too vague to be concretely addressed. So it's impossible for the company to really uh, respond and to give everything what the person wants. So what do we uh, recommend our clients, um, so the companies, what do we recommend them I mean, in these uh, cases? Well, is to require more information from the data subject. And then a lot of data subjects say like, okay, never mind. Uh, I don't want to I give you more information to just get access to my information, but we need to protect the data from all the users. Uh, so the first thing is that the data subject needs to identify uh, himself. So he needs to give his name, uh, a nationality, date of birth, and so on, and there needs to be proof of that. So he needs to provide evidentiary, evidentiary documentation. On this, um, also note that Recital 64 uh, requires that, that controllers use reasonable means uh, to, check the, to verify the identity uh, of the data subject uh, that is requesting for access. Uh, a second thing that we ask is a description of the nature and the context of the request. Um, it needs to be clear 
but a ride is that the person wants to exercise, uh, but also to which the personal data relates. And that sounds obvious when you are the data subject, but from the platform side, it's not that easy because we, uh, well, we, Goodwell, uh, has users that are registered not via uh, an email address, but only uh, by a phone number. Uh, so when they write an email to the DPO, um, we don't know who these people are. So we need more context about what their profile is and why they think um, that Goodwill is processing data about them. That is a, a third point there, is uh, we, we ask for a clarification on how and when the data subject believes that uh, Goodwill or any other company would have uh, collected and received the data. Um, yes, in, in the context, uh, we also ask uh, whether the data subject needs the personal data to bring legal action uh, to the company. And then uh, there are some formalities. Um, first of all, there needs to be a formal confirmation that the request is uh, lawful in view of applicable law, but also that the data subject is authorized to make the request. And then uh, the confirmation that the data subject is an adult and in a legal capacity to represent himself. In Goodwill's case, there is um, a lot of minors, and sometimes they are also under uh, the age of 16. And then we also need to have all this information from so the third party requester, and there needs to be a proof uh, of his legal capacity to represent the minor. Uh, but to be honest, for the companies that I have been working with, uh, I must say that there is not really a problem with their willingness uh, to share all the personal data that they are processing about data subject, data subject, but the request needs to be clear enough uh, for them to, be, to make it possible to respond. I mean, it cannot become a full-time job of, of one of the, uh, one of the, 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 the people uh, from the company to just have all these things checked over and over again. So how, how, what is the reaction of the company if they get unclear requests? Uh, it's not clear to them whether a data subject wants everything or just something, or when the identification is difficult because the identifier uh, maybe is not uh, your paper ID, but a cookie. Uh, do, you, do you, I'm by the way already moving us into the discussion phase because I think that identification and authentication issue is quite important also in this debate. Uh, uh, how, do you have practical cases, how you dealt with them? Uh, we always, we have a, a standard form that we use, a standard identification form. Every uh, formal and, and informal request that comes in, uh, we send back this form that needs to be filled out, which, which has the, the headings that I just set out. And then we ask for um, all the, well, all the evidence. So we ask for a government issued. Uh, you ask about them? Yes. Okay, so that would be a controversial issue if, if I was your client, because uh, as uh, in Panopticon Foundation, we also send uh, uh, quite some, <laughs> quite a few data subject requests, including those based uh, exclusively on cookies that many companies leave on our devices. And we still believe that if I have a cookie uh, that identifies me in the database of a certain company, that company, uh, in my opinion, has obligation to reveal my data related to this cookie without questioning my identity. But I'm wondering whether other uh, speakers on our panel have struggled or have concepts how to deal with this authentication issue, uh, especially with regards to, to, to generated data that not always is linked to um, email address or, or your formal uh, ID, but sometimes is based on something as, um, as non-tangible as a cookie. Max, yes? We actually, I mean, I'm not allowed to say all too much about it, but that's like a project that we're working on a bit as well. Um, we need it for something else. But um, I think actually with the cookie stuff, we were kind of struggling with that a bit at the beginning as well. Um, but I think GDPR is actually rather clear, and a lot of people apparently haven't looked at that yet. Um, there's two different things. There's identification and authentication. And Article 11 basically says if you cannot identify someone, you don't have to do further processing to figure out who that person is. But identification is usually not the problem in the cookie situation. You do have an identifier where you can absolutely figure out which data set we're debating about. Um, the problem is then usually authentication, in the sense of how can I figure out if that's the real person. And usually what we argued with the cookies at least was like realistically who else should have my cookie data than me? Um, no one, because it's stored on my device. 
Um, so just the fact that you have this cookie information probably identifies you much better or authenticates you much better than any ID. Like, I mean, my ID has nothing to do with the cookie data. Like, I couldn't, could send any cookie data and then ID. It's like not even anything you could connect with each other. The interesting thing, however, in GDPR is that on an article 12, I think it's paragraph 6 or something, um, they say basically if you cannot um, authenticate someone, then the company has to ask further questions but it does not say it can deny the access. And that's okay. fundamentally different than if you cannot identify a person. And that differentiation, even in the legal books, some of them, like in the German legal books at least, some of them do make that differentiation. A lot of the others probably haven't really thought about these differences in identification, authentication. I don't really know why the legislator has done it that way, because I think authentication oftentimes is the probably bigger issue, like if you cannot do yeah. that. Um, but if from, from the side of an, a person that requests the access, that is probably the, the answer to that, at least in, in my view so far, it may change over time, but yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting, my experience obviously is, is, is different, that's why I'm complaining uh, on this issue because uh, at least Polish uh, uh, websites and internet companies that we dealt with, uh, they actually say, since we cannot authenticate you, dear users, and we cannot uh, breach security of our data because that's our utmost uh, protected value here to protect uh, your rights. In, in fact, so the argument is for your own good, uh, for, for the sake of protecting your own data, dear user, we will not give you this data because we are not 100% sure that this is you. Uh, so we struggle just with to this. add, I mean, they do have an argument because they do have the duty to also have security under GDPR. Absolutely. These yes. two articles basically then get into conflict with each other and um, I just pulled it up, it's, it's 12, um, 6, um, so if, if you cannot authenticate, the controller may request, um, uh, um, may request of additional information um, to confirm that, but it, that's basically the solution is ask for more information, but not... Or denied. create a privacy by design system and, and design it in a way where you can authenticate in a secure way from the beginning. Uh, which can be done. Uh, I used, uh, uh, among other things, I requested my data from uh, Tabula, uh, which has an excellent service online where you simply identify yourself with a cookie, but you don't send this cookie to them. You uh, basically click, uh, click on a website and they check in their database, in their secure system, whether that cookie is uh, uh, authentic, whether you are you, and they give you data. It can be as simple as that. It can be designed uh, to be secure and simple. But uh, from, from your opening remarks, uh, dear speakers, I've heard two other interesting points that I want to follow up and invite your comments or any other comments that you want to share before. Uh, we open uh, to the, the, the audience. Um, uh, one is uh, that data that disappear. I'm quite puzzled how to deal with this issue because if data was generated on the fly and it was used to inform certain decision, for example, decision about what ad should be screened or what news feeds should be shown to the user, that data mattered. That data was actually used by, processed by, by data, data controller. Even if it was deleted a second later, it existed. So so I struggle with simply accepting this argument that since data no longer exists, nobody can access to it. How would you approach this? And uh, the second uh, puzzling uh, thing for me in this discussion is this intellectual property uh, versus, uh, versus access uh, debate. Um, I hear from companies that I'm asking for my data uh, an a interesting version of this argument they not only say that they will not reveal the logic behind profiling, we all know it's difficult, but they even go as far to say they will not give me my generated data because, uh, attention, <laughs> uh, if everybody does it, if more users do it, you know what I'm getting at, right? People will collect the generated data, will reverse engineer those secret algorithms that led to generating those particular data of, say, hundreds of users, and the company will go bust or it will lose its competitive advantage. How would you approach such argument or any other argument around this IP versus access um, uh, de debate? I invite your comments and uh, soon we will open also to, to the rest. Irina, you are smiling. Maybe you want to start. Yeah, I'm smiling because uh, I love IP, but I, I truly don't understand. You wouldn't come up with this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm facing this issue in this case as a legal consultant. We have 
researched a lot whether this um, IP protection can be applied to online platforms and it can of course in some cases when we talk about software behind and we talk about some algorithms and other uh, truly intellectual property but when we talk about data this is something completely different from my perspective. I would say that this is uh, information that is stored there, but uh, it's not creative. If we talk about the social network, they do not create it. So this is the first thing. And if we talk about related rights, like generous right, um, well, how do they actually invest in collecting them or creating them or whatever? So for me, it's also a big question. And I think that Intellectual property is probably not the thing that should be applied here. Mm -hmm. uh, Shnezana, maybe do you have some comments from the authority? <laughs> well, I can only agree. In fact, uh, um, we are talking here about fundamental right and a fundamental right that is exercised by an individual. So one person asking for access to their data, for their data to be ported, will not necessarily put uh, the businesses, intellectual property rights and other rights at risk. I would say even if, if we, there are 100, we <laughs> still give it yes, to them. But <laughs> yes. and the, So you are asking for, for your own data. You're not asking for the algorithm that they, the, 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 they take. You are entitled to, to have access to your data. You're entitled to have, um, uh, to have your data given or ported to another uh, controller. So if you're not misusing this, then you, you still have your rights. If you are misusing it, well, then that's the different, uh, we are in a different situation. And uh, perhaps then it's an excessive demand and so on. So, but uh, again, it's data protection authorities can, uh, can be there to help uh, 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 screen any of these uh, refuse, unjustified refusals. Uh, also, uh, um, uh, the, um, now with the GDPR, you have the, uh, the right of different organizations to represent different uh, data subjects. So uh, if one person cannot uh, succeed getting their right, maybe these uh, organizations can uh, succeed to, to get the rights of other data subjects respected, and then uh, uh, that one person can then get data uh, from this other way. Mm -hmm. you, can, you don't necessarily have to go to the DPA, you don't necessarily have to go to the court, you can still have find some other ways to uh, get your rights respected. Uh, thank you. Rusman, as a chair, would you like to make a comment? And uh, I'm waiting now for comments from the audience, please. Yeah, um, perhaps this is also something we can discuss with the audience. Um, I, I would just like to raise one issue related to cookies, uh, because when, when cookies are used, they usually gather quite technical information, like for example, which pages user accept, uh, accessed on the website. Uh, and the, the real value of the cookie is not actually this information, but the information which can be inferred about the habits of the users, about what uh, goods can be offered to the users. Um, but the dividing line between the personal data and this inferred data, I think, is very, very thin and not quite clear. For example, I, I think that can lead to issues in practice. For example, when a user asks to, to access the information which a website holds on him uh, and asks to access all of the information, which, which specific information, in this case, the, web, the website should provide? Should, should it only provide this specific technical information? Or should the website also provide the information about the user habits and so on? Thank you. Yeah, I would say it's de determined by user in his or her access request. If I'm saying to the company, please give me everything, it just means everything. And I don't have to, as a user, be informed in advance about categories of data, right? I tried this asking my data from my bank, uh, which uh, has my mobile app uh, and uh, probably some credit history and, and things like this. And what they gave me in return was my name, surname, address, and um, those, you know, those uh, standing orders you make. And I was laughing at this data set. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Like, where is all my behavioral data from this app that they have? So, yes, I would say it's on company side, it should be to, to define what everything means and not users should be guessing. But that's my point of view, and uh, I invite others to comment. Uh, Yushi, would you like to comment before yes. we hear questions? 
I have uh, just on this point. Sometimes it's 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 just impossible um, to provide all the data. When when someone asks you, I want everything, you need to know in which con. I mean, it it needs to be more or less clear where this data need to be found. Um, and that is when, when you just uh, pop an email, I want access to all. Then that. But then there's a conversation that you mentioned. Then there's a conversation between company clarifying requests, yeah. not a denial. No, it's not a denial. We, I, um, so as far as I know, uh, we never received uh, any access request that was completely denied. And um, I think that the data subjects were satisfied, but it takes a lot of time. <laughs> Thank you for making the effort. Uh, can we hear your comment or question and uh, who you are, please? Hi. Uh, my name is Alicia McDonald. I'm a professor at Carnegie Mellon, and I live in California in the United States. I'm going to give you a bit of legislation, legislative history so you understand my question first. Um, we had a multimillionaire who got a ballot proposition, uh, and uh, the ballot proposition in California, we have a direct democracy in a way a lot, a lot of other states don't, would give people new rights for data access uh, and a number of other things. It's been referred to as GDPR light. Um, in the end, there was a negotiation that had this turned from a ballot measure which had 80% support. This was just after Cambridge Analytica. So it would have won. We would have voted it in. We would have amended our constitution to have these rights. Um, it also would have had a stronger private right of action for, com for individuals to sue the companies. So instead, this became uh, a new law, uh, AB 375, and it passed. And in exchange for the new law, um, Alistair McTaggart, who had done this ballot proposition, withdrew the ballot proposition. Okay, we have until January 2020, before this comes into effect, one of the big kind of we'll figure it out later points that the California Attorney General is trying to figure out is what do we do with these access requests? So we have the opportunity in the next few months to do some cleanup bills and to clarify rather than just the AG will figure it out. So my question to any panelist who's interested is, great, we have this green field, we can learn from you. What should we make sure is in or out for the issues of authentication, which we're going to hear about as being anti-competitive, the concern will be, um, I'm Facebook, and uh, somebody competing is going to spam me with requests for data deletion in particular, right? That's going to be their concern that they're going to raise. So they want a strong authentication. But of course, we also, in this case, very unusual for the United States, we're able to have third parties submit on behalf. That is written in already. So how do we make this work when the third party would not have the cookies necessarily? Any advice as to how we can do a better job? Mm -hmm. Any advice while we are waiting for more comments or questions? Thank you, that was a very interesting question. The problem, it's a very open question, so there's <laughs> there could be hundreds of different reasons to do something one or the other way. Um, for, the, for, for example, the representation, that's probably what we do at the core of NOIP, so the whole idea is to represent other data subjects, and obviously we are thinking about mass you know, actions that are possible through representation. Um, however, like if the core issues, we I think like the authentication is usually with platforms like Facebook not a big thing because you log in and they kind of authenticate you through your password and login data and so on. Um, sorry. Okay. Um, so that's not a big th issue. Usually the identification, we just had that before. I think that is usually if you get a request as well, um, there may be a request, I want to have all my data with a good um, identificator, then I guess you got to give it. Um, however, if it says I want to have all my data and you have run databases that are all spread out and you can't find it with only that information, then you have to provide that further identification information. That's what we do so far. I think it works reasonably well. I thought it was kind of interesting when GDPR came around, especially in the US debate, that suddenly the right to access became like this security threat that the right of access has existed since 1995 in Europe, and I, I, I personally don't know of any bigger issues with it. I'm sure there were some issues here and there as with any of these rights and processing operations, like there are data breaches all over the world with all, all the time, but I, I, the right to access usually gives you access to one data set in one time, so you can't really use it for like crazy big data breaches. 
um, in, in my experience at least. But I, I thought there was like this kind of fear mongering a bit in, in the US on that. So I, I don't know if that helps you in any way what I'm saying, but that's probably the closest of what I can answer. And w w would, would panelists here agree that what we have in GDPR uh, regarding access, the framing actually is quite, could be useful also for other legislations or are they, are they clear uh, problems in GDPR, in the wording of GDPR that could be fixed, say in, in, in California? Do you have any lessons uh, on, on the wording or any other person from the audience, please? May I be probably add to like the reframe question if that's possible, because it ties into what I wanted to say before as well. Um, one problem is really this, this um, Article 15, um, Paragraph 4, that is just very vague and doesn't really say much. And especially we had the debate before about IP rights. Now, there are different types of IP rights. If something is copyrighted and I have the right to copyright, then anybody else may have that data, but I still own that copyright. I mean, that's the whole idea of copyright, that thousands of people have my picture, but I still own my copyright. So the idea that someone else gets the data doesn't really change anything with it. Um, if it's about trade secrets, the oldest thing about trade secrets is other people are going to reverse engineer your thing. Like the first trade secrets around was like there's some box that is some machine that does something. Now the competitor got that box and unscrewed it to figure out what the competitor did. Big news. Um, obviously, they're going to try that with, with data as well. If a right to access is one of the means to do that. Uh, yeah. that's, it's just that's, a matter of time. Yeah. That's nothing new for the trade secret world. <laughs> um, so it's kind of funny how suddenly there's like just this word IP rights. And if you like, look into the individual IP rights, I, I don't really see the one where the right to access is really killing it in a weird way that it doesn't do in any other sector as well. Yeah. Um, so, um, so far I had a bit Sometimes. of a problem. What we ran into the most actually was that um, companies didn't want to tell us the sources of the data and the recipients of data which you get on the Article 14 as well. And that was oftentimes connected to, I don't want you to know who I trade with, who I cooperate with. But exactly that is the balancing, I think, that the legislator did to say, you as a customer are allowed, if there is, for example, I had that in my own family, just wrong credit information, you got to know where the credit information comes from to rectify it ever. Like, this is the whole idea of the law. And there, I guess, the legislator simply said that interest is higher interest than the company's interest in not telling you where they got their data from. Yeah. Um, so the advice companies. would be to get the balance right and clear in the law, not to be uh, surprised later with the case law or interpretations from companies. Uh, Yusha, I think you will have a comment as well. And we yes, about uh, uh, IP. I think that in, in other contexts, um, it is uh, a valuable argument. Um, we, we have this client and, and it, well, it, it provides assessment centers so for other companies, so uh, candidates will apply. Uh, and we have several access requests there. Of course, it's always uh, rejections. So yeah. after rejections, people are very, um, feeling very strong about this. And then uh, what we recommend then is not to give anything um, that of the answers that is a, a direct, uh, well, that would show um, how the assessment center is built up, and that is actually IP, because otherwise, uh, competitors oh, yeah. could really use it. The raw data should be okay. Yes, the raw data, yeah. But then the question, so the data subject in this case, one of the data subjects in, in this case, he was not happy, so he wanted to see everything. He wanted to see all the nodes uh, of the uh, assessor, the, but that is just not possible because of IP, right? So sometimes it can be. Probably if it's just like written notes, you would fall outside of GDPR anyway, so... Then you have to go to the... No, but as, as a data subject, especially in case of uh, these evaluations uh, where you have uh, like, uh, for uh, either for uh, recruitment, for evaluation of a staff and so on, I mean, data, uh, data protection authorities, including the EDPS, have always recommended in case of, uh, uh, of an access request, to give access to as much information as possible, because you are you need to be transparent of, about how uh, you reach the certain decision. You need to be uh, the, the people have the right to get those answers. You don't need uh, you you don't give the uh, the personal data of the others. So you you can you might provide that uh, if you're if, if we're talking about the evaluation sheets. You might provide anonymized evaluation sheets without the comments of the uh, of the evaluators. Uh, uh, you might uh, uh, also say provide statistics how the answers of the uh, of the complainant, let's say, of, uh, of the data subject, compare to uh, to the other candidates in a, let's say big uh, 
um, but so, sort of anonymized statistical manner. So where the data subject would fit in a scale and so on. But you give answers. You do not. Yes. Yes, the answer is, but do okay. you say that? I will, yeah. I will, I will um, park this because I think it's getting into details and uh, audience might be losing it. And we have, I think, interesting coming, comments coming up. Uh, please. Yeah, I, I could um, continue on that one because it's one idea or solution. Tell I, us who you are. Sorry. Uh, I'm Oliver Federman from Fitzkartsmoor. And to continue with that one, um, I also wanted to um, to conclude with the idea that you can um, share your information as uh, or at the maximum as you can. I mean, your interests of the uh, company should be the border, I think, because you can't hand over your own, I don't know, geheimnis, uh, um, uh, interests or secrets. Thank you. Um, and uh, another idea could be that in terms of um, transparency, maybe you can... Um, share your maximum um, data, you, you can hand them over, like uh, you can hand them over a list, so there's written in it, I can give you the information about this one and that one, and how was your behavior in, on my website, and so on and so on. So they can choose what they want to see, maybe. So the um, problem with the um, not exact, um, uh, interest in handed, uh, getting the information from you could be um, more strictly. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, next comment, please. We will collect more now uh, so that we can do the closing round uh, in five minutes. Okay, uh, I'm Rene Mayeu. I'm doing a, a PhD research on the right of access at the VUB in uh, Brussels. Um, I want to return to this question of misuse of law and also in the context, for example, of an assessment center, because I think there, there has already been case law on this, uh, Novak, and actually there, the case for misuse of law was actually made by the DPA of Ireland, saying that, well, if we give access to this data, then maybe the data subject is going to request rectification of his answers and then going to try to get a better result, which, <laughs> well, um, Luckily, the judge uh, actually didn't uh, agree with that argumentation, and not only that, they also said that um, also the notes of the assessor, if they're written on the exam, actually are uh, subject to access requests, and there is the right to see also those. And um, there is actually quite a list. I could go on with all kinds of cases in which companies, or in some weird cases, the Irish DPA, argued that there was misuse of law, and basically, the court never goes with that argument so far. So it's wor worth trying. Have, <laughs> Thank you for sharing this experience. Just, uh, just to add a little bit. I mean, why do you? Uh, why are we so uh, emphasizing the importance of transparency, the importance of giving information? It's because you by having this information up front, then you can see whether the uh, processing was lawful, whether the processing was fair, whether you need to then, if you, if you think that there, there was something wrong with the processing itself, then you can exercise all the other rights. You can go to, to, uh, to you can complain to the DPA, you can go to the courts, and so on. So it's, it, you have to have, without information, you can't have a proper re redress mechanism. Yeah, I, I strongly agree with you on this one, but since we have this balancing thing in building in GDPR, now we have to struggle with counter-arguments. Any experience on this, sir? <laughs> Thank you. I am Antoine, a student in IMT uh, Data Protection Master in Paris, and I am also running the dating sites, small dating uh, applications. So I have two questions. First question, uh, Article 9.2.E, of GDPR states that, that uh, the special protection provisions of 9.1 do not apply if information is publicly made available. So what are the consequences on uh, pl platform data uh, mm -hmm. on this with the sp specific and special consent? That's the first question. Second question, do you see a conflict between 
the free scrapping of data on platform and the protection of the data for the data subject. Does it conflict somewhere? Thank you. Thank you. Very two good practical concrete questions. I invite uh, my panelists, uh, whoever wants to uh, comment on them. We I think I think have five minutes left for discussion, and then we will move to the to the closing summary. Who wants to respond? Well, I can say. I mean, just because uh, the person made some. So we're talking here about uh, the uh, special categories of personal data. And the prohibition, uh, general prohibition, uh, not to process them uh, doesn't apply in case the data subject made that uh, special categories of personal data explicitly, explicitly public. So that, that m meant that they had, they realized that by making this public, they will allow other processors to, pro to or other people to see it, to use it, and so on. However, still, just because it was, well, at least in my opinion, just because it was made public doesn't mean that you don't have to, if you see that information somewhere, that if you want to reuse it, that you, uh, that, uh, you don't have to have a legal basis to use that uh, personal data and so on. So it's, yeah. Yes, so exactly. The right to information, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Well... Uh, Max, I think you wanted to comment. To comment? Um, probably just on, that's actually one of the things I'm wondering during GDPR negotiations already because I was like, this is crazy, but let's, it's the hardest question I'm going to answer the last. <laughs> um, for, the, for the matter of exact requests, I think that's a problem that we get into debate sometimes that like um, companies request people to say, you explicitly have to tell us which data you want. Now the whole idea of the right to access is to ask a company, what data do you have on me even if I don't know because that's like, if I already know what they have, then like, the interest in it is, 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 is relative, which doesn't mean that you don't have to help them to find it as far as you can. But usually all the access requests I ever made was always all the data you have because my whole interest is in what shady things happen in the background that I don't know of. Like, otherwise I can like, just don't exercise that right anyways. Um, the the um, other thing on the, on the Nova case that was like a real fun case because there was like all these theories of what you could theoretically do with a test sheet if you gave it to someone else. And it's, it's, it's see, you see how like a lot of lawyers are becoming very creative to block these access requests sometimes. And, and the Irish DPA is always a good um, place to go to get weird um, responses, as I know. So that's probably a place where you get these things then in decisions as well. Um, but that was actually an appeal that went all the way up and that guy, pretty much as far as I know, risked risk his whole financial future on this access request question. So because court procedures are really expensive in Ireland. So that was really one of these things that was really interesting. On two, um, 92E, um, I had that problem because that also applies logically for non-specialized data. Like it's not in, there's no such thing in, in six, but if it's okay for special categories of data, obviously it should be okay for normal data, I guess. Like that's at least in the legal literature, some argument that comes along. And the problem is then um, people manifestly make stuff public on Twitter and so on, but they do it for a different purpose. So I was always wondering if we can kind of get that back into it, the purpose limitation and say, yes. I made it public for being on Twitter but I don't make it public to kind of figure out my personal psychological issues through my Twitter feed, which probably like in Austrian politics, out of my Twitter feed, you can totally get my psychological issues with Austrian politics, um, but that is not the reason I posted it. Um, so uh, we could probably get that back in through that, but actually I have only kind of thought about it. I haven't really researched it so far. Um, but obviously all the other rights you have still exist, like just because they have a legal basis to process the data, you still have all your rights to access and so on. So. That's kind of obvious anyways. But you need to be informed, right? That uh, somebody scraped your data, and I think that's the tricky bit, that if scraping happens uh, on yeah. the grounds that you mentioned, yeah, you still have like 13, it could be a tricky so yeah. uh, thing to find out. So I think we are going probably to have interesting cases around those. It's it's super interesting uh, topic. Um, yeah, know? I think I will uh, comment on the, on the second one also, because we, were, of course, were thinking about this issue when we were dealing with the case and still thinking uh, that uh, data that that we put online and even if we make it public, are we aware and are we okay that uh, it's gonna be used, for example, for scoring by the bank? Um, and there are several separate opinions on that, but uh, if we consider our uh, 
putting the settings that we want our information to be public as a consent, and then we say, yes, we want this to be public, and we realize that everyone, search engines, anyone else, will have access to this data. Then we probably agree that, yes, it can be used somehow that we even cannot anticipate. Um, there are, uh, another aspect is, for example, if, um, let's say, an alternative platform is created, based on the open data that we put online. It's like a mirror, let's say. And then when I close my data, this mirror is still open and I cannot control it. So these cases, of course, I think is not okay uh, from a data subject uh, perspective. But the scraping itself of the open information and using it for some other purposes is, I think, more okay than not okay. So. But this is, a, of course, a matter of discussion, a hot topic right now. Yeah, as long as the scraper has a point uh, on what's legal basis here and uh, what's the legitimate purpose, uh, under GDPR, at least. Um, well, I don't see other comments and questions. I think we have a lot of food for thought, and maybe I ask Ruslan to help us digest it and uh, leave the room with some, at least, maybe not action points, but uh, points for reflection. Uh, <clears throat> sure, uh, let me try to summarize a bit what was discussed. Uh, I think it's quite undeniable from the business perspective that personal data is becoming a commodity of companies. Uh, businesses of many online platforms like social networks depend on personal data. And for them, personal data is a very important asset. They would want to protect it uh, and restrict access to it to third parties. Uh, but it remains to be seen what particular legal instruments could be used to provide them with this opportunity. And in this regard, I think the, um, uh, what Irina said was very interesting about whether personal data can be intellectual property, like database. Uh, I think there are also possible other means to protect personal data by websites, such as, for example, contractual means by using the terms and conditions of the website. Um, but uh, as Nijana mentioned, uh, if we do recognize uh, personal data as a commodity, it is also important to introduce a system of checks and balances to make sure that the interests of data subjects and other interested parties are not infringed. And there are different ways how this can, uh, can be done. Uh, as Nijan mentioned, this could be covered by data protection legislation, uh, but it, it can also be addressed by competition norms and by consumer protection legislation as well. Uh, speaking about data protection, I really like uh, the comment which Max made about whether users can be seen not only as data subject but also as data controllers, because th this can really, in my opinion, change. Yeah, it, it, it changes our view on, on the whole process and whether. Thank you. Uh, and who is ultimately responsible and who, who decides how personal data can be used? Uh, and. Speaking about data protection and about the rights of data subjects, in particular, uh, right to access personal data, I think they, that uh, Yun Shin made quite a lot of interesting comments and gave practical insights about these, uh, how these um, data access requests can be processed, and that in practice it's, it can be a challenge for a website to uh, identify the person behind the request to make sure that it's legitimate, and also to decide which specific data should be provided. Uh, because when when the user asks all data, uh, it's it's uh, the uh, the website still has to decide which particular data to provide. I think that's quite a lot what we uh, come back home with. Um, I would like to close uh, the panel with this and to thank you all for your attendance and uh, for your comments and thank uh, the members of the panel. <laughs>